So now for the sermon. If you remember a few weeks ago, one of the sermons, my intro was about how I kind of started a fight. If you remember, and some of you who weren't here are like, what? You started a fight? Anyway, and so essentially, I'll give you a quick synopsis of what happened. Uh, somebody wore my shorts that I was going to wear for school for soccer practice. I got mad. I kneed them in the stomach and pushed them on the ground. So it wasn't really a fight. It was more of me being mean. Um, <laughs> And so that happened, and I told you about that story. The coach walked in. I got in trouble. That is that. But this Sunday, I want to tell you a story that might be a little redeeming. Um, it was a time where I kind of stopped a fight. It was in also in middle school. I was just kind of in it in middle school. I, I don't know. I wasn't a troublemaker, but I was around troubled kids, I guess. So anyway, uh, it was during soccer practice. We were actually in the gym, the indoor gym at the time, and there was this one kid who threw a basketball at another kid, and the other kid obviously got really mad. And so he started to run at him, he started to push him, they started getting each other's faces. And at the time, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to stop this. So I get between these two kids. Now keep in mind, then I was probably like 5'3". I'm 5'7 now, I'm still not that tall, but I was much shorter then. And so I'm between these two dudes who are probably five, nine at the time, and so I'm trying to keep them apart. They're yelling at each other. They're definitely going to fight if something doesn't happen to stop them. And so I'm in between them trying to stop them, and then one, he pushes me out of the way to the ground, and then he runs at the other kid. They're running at each other, and then I get up, and the way I quote-unquote stop the fight is I tripped one of them. Um, and then the coach came in, and then the fight didn't actually happen. So I don't know if you can technically consider that stopping a fight. It was more of me tripping somebody so that they wouldn't fight. So I don't know if that's what Jesus has in mind when he says in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. I don't know if you can consider tripping somebody to stop a fight peacemaking, but that's what I did. Now, being peacemakers is something I think we all ought to be as Christians, but Matthew 5, 9, when you read that, it might be a little confusing, right? Peacemakers, what are you talking about, Jesus? I thought you said in Matthew 10 that, do not think I've come to bring, bring peace on earth, but I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Right, so at first glance, when you read Matthew 5, 9, you might be thinking, Jesus, are you contradicting yourself? What's going on here? But if you take a look at the context, if you could go to the next slide. If you take a look at the context of Matthew 10, when Jesus says, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. He was just talking about talking to his disciples, or rather his apostles, and how he's going to send them out to preach and to heal people. And then in the context, he's talking about how they are going to be persecuted. So I don't think Jesus is saying that, oh, you've got to go out into the world and stir up trouble. Rather, the, the healing, the preaching that they are doing peacefully will sometimes invite a response from others that they will not be peaceful towards them. So no, I don't think Jesus is contradicting himself when he says, do not think I've come to bring peace, and when he says, be peacemakers, right? Sometimes, even if we are peaceful, others will not respond peacefully, right? Jesus on earth, he showed love, he'd healed others, but he was killed. So sometimes, even if you are a peacemaker, people may not be peaceful towards you, so I don't think Jesus is contradicting himself. So, what is peace anyway, right? What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, let's take a look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. The text says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now I know this is a little early, 
uh, typically you'd ha- take one of these passages and it's a Christmas sermon. But I want you to notice something about this passage. When these multitudes say, peace on the earth and among those with whom he is pleased. Do you think they're just referring to a general peace? Right, what, what just happened here? Jesus, he, he's born, he's on earth, and guess what they say? Peace among those with whom he is pleased. I don't think this is just general peace. This peace is referring to someone specific. In fact, I think this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So if you want to know where peace is or what peace is, who do you got to look to? Jesus. Jesus being the Prince of Peace. Now, we kind of touched on this in a way a few weeks ago when we talked about God being the standard of good. So, if God is the standard of good, where do all good things come from? God. Since peace is a good thing, where does peace come from? God. John 16, 33, it says, In me, Jesus says, In me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take a heart. I have overcome the world. So, peace comes from him. So before defining peace with words, you have to know its source. Right? Outside of Christ, outside of God, you're not going to have true peace. So then how do we define peace with words then? So the, the word, it's arene in the Greek, and it can mean tranquility, harmony, unity, or well-wishing. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in every single one of his letters, he opens with grace and peace, to you. So to greet somebody with peace was essentially just saying, I wish you well, all right? So you want to know peacemaking basics, all right? Do you want to be a peacemaker? Then wish well of others, all right? Too many people carry around ill will in this world, in our society. I think of recently, you know, we just had our midterm elections, right? our midterm elections, and now I'm not going to name names or anything, but recently I joined a Facebook group of uh, some, some Mineral Springs Facebook groups for the community, and again, not mentioning names, but what I saw was not peacemaking. I'm just going to be honest. All right, and maybe some of you saw this. But just around our politics, just electing people into government brings so much hostility. Maybe the outcome wasn't what you wanted. Maybe uh, the, the Senate is not what you want. Maybe the House is not what you want. Maybe the government in its current state is not what you want. But that doesn't mean you can't be a peacemaker. In our society, in virtually all societies, people have had trouble making peace. I wouldn't say because of this, but it has to do with differences. Differences between people and groups and ideologies. Now, not so much the differences cause division. It's more so our response to differences that cause division and cause a lack of peace. Right, for instance, in Jesus' time, the two big groups, Jews and Gentiles, and the Samaritans, of course, could be thrown in as another group that they just had trouble having peace. Why? Not necessarily because of their differences, right? Because they were different, different culturally, ethnically, and religiously. It wasn't necessarily because of their differences, rather because of their response to their differences.
Does peace mean we have to look and act the same way? No. For the Jews and the Gentiles, they could not look the same way, right? The circumcised Jews could not reverse the process. And the Gentiles, according to Acts 15, they were not demanded to be circumcised. Right? To have peace, what we see is we don't have to look and act the same way. Our differences don't cause division. It's our response to them. So y'all can wear your Razorback uniforms and your Razorback colors, and I'll continue to wear my Baylor green and gold, and we can still have peace, right? It doesn't matter that Baylor's the better team. You know, we can, we can still have peace. I just joke, and I know Eddie's probably like, oh, I want to get him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you get my point. I joke a bit, but this is serious. Uh, there, there can be disagreements, there can be differences, but that does not mean we cannot have peace. For instance, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In the context of the Jews and Gentiles being united in Christ. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace. Again, Christ is our peace. He is the source of peace. So really, the only way we're going to have true peace is in him. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Let me ask you a question. Does that say he broke down the dividing wall of physical markers? Of physical differences? No. It says he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Yes, the Jews and Gentiles, they were still different. They still looked different. They might have still acted a little different, but that does not mean they couldn't have had peace. You see, what really divided them was their hostility, not their differences. And so today, in light of our midterm elections and everything, man, I, I see so many people being hostile towards one another. And again, those differences, they don't cause hostility. That is your response to differences. You have a choice whether or not you have peace with others. Now, just as a caveat, remember, you can do all the peacemaking. You can do all the well-wishing towards others, but that does not guarantee others will be peaceful towards you, right? Take Jesus' last week on earth, for example. You know, uh, the, the Jews handed him over to be killed. Judas betrayed him. His disciples fled from him. Jesus, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was spat upon. Uh, they, they didn't, the world didn't offer a single moment of peace towards him, but Jesus, he went peacefully to the cross. He went peacefully into custody. Though there was so much pain, Jesus was peaceful. He was peaceful even though really nobody offered peace to him. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. This is after Jesus had died, he was killed, and after he had been raised. And so after this traumatic event, not only for him, but for his disciples, this is what he has to say. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked uh, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then his disciples, they were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to him, Unless I see in his hands the, the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So after everything, after having been taken into custody, after having been whipped, after having been nailed to the cross, after having endured so much pain and having died, he comes back to his disciples, his apostles, who are hiding. They're hiding because they know the Jews. They don't have any peace for them. They're next. Jesus comes back in a time that there seems to be no peace at all, and he says to them, peace be with you. He says to Thomas, look at, my, look at the holes in my hand, look at the hole in my side, look at, look at the scars from what happened to me, because people were not peaceful. And he looks at him and says, peace be with you. See, if you don't get anything else, get this. No matter the state of our world, no matter the state of our society, no matter how people may treat you, it does not mean you cannot be a peacemaker. The world, society, treated Jesus not with an ounce of peace. And he comes in a time without peace and tells them, peace be with you. In response to tribulation the world offers, we offer peace, or rather we should offer peace, because Christ is the Prince of Peace. He is the source of peace. And so if we really want to be a part of who he is, if we really want to be a part of the body of Christ, that means being a peacemaker. Do you want to be called a son or daughter of God? But because if we're not peacemakers, if all we offer is hostility to somebody that just because they're different than us, you're not going to be called a son. You're not going to be called a daughter if you do not offer peace. If you want that peace, if you want to be called a son or daughter, you can take that first step now as we stand and sing.